द सेजेस ऑफ इंडिया समरी आई टू आइडियल्स ऑफ ट्रूथ टू आइडियल्स ऑफ ट्रूथ आर इन आर स्क्रिप्चर्स द वन इज वॉट वी कॉल द एटरनैल एंड द अदर इज नॉट सो ऑथोरिटेटिव येट बाइंडिंग अंडर पर्टिक्युलर सर्कमस्टेंसिस टाइम्स एंड प्लेसिस आइडिया इज दैट द फ्रेमवर्क ऑफ द डेस्टिनी एंड गोल ऑफ मैन हैज बीन ऑल डिलिनिएटेड इन द वेदास the details have been left to be worked out in the smritis and puranas as for general directions the shrutis are enough for spiritual life nothing more can be said nothing more can be known to the impersonal personal god this is a peculiarity which we have to understand that our religion preaches an impersonal personal god it preaches any amount of impersonal loss plus any amount of personality but the very fountain head of our religion is in the shrutis the vedas which are perfectly impersonal the persons all come in the smritis and puranas the great avataras incarnations of god prophets and so forth vedanta only can be the universal religion that it is already the existing universal religion in the world because it teaches principles and not persons no religion built upon a person can be taken up as a type by all the races of mankind three the rishis discoverers of spiritual truths how comes then the knowledge which the vedas declare it comes through being a rishi beyond consciousness is where the bold search lies consciousness is bound by the senses beyond that beyond the senses men must go in order to arrive at truths of the spiritual world and there are even now persons who succeed in going beyond the bounds of the senses these are called rishis because they come face to face with spiritual truths for the rishi ideal religion is not in books nor in theories nor in dogmas nor in talking not even in reasoning it is being and becoming a my friends until each one of you has become a rishi and come face to face with spiritual facts religious life has not begun for you until the super conscious opens for you religion is mere talk it is nothing but preparation when you have known god your very face will be changed your voice will be changed your whole appearance will he changed you will be a blessing to mankind none will be able to resist the rishi this is the rishihood the ideal in our religion swami vivekananda talks about the world moving sages the great incarnations of which we will cover rama and sita and krishna on rama rama the ancient idol of the heroic ages the embodiment of truth of morality the ideal son the ideal husband the ideal father and above all the ideal king this rama has been presented before us by the great sage valmiki on sita sita is unique that character was depicted once and for all she is the very type of the true indian woman for all the indian ideals of a perfected woman have grown out of that one life of sita there she will always be this glorious sita purer than purity itself all patience and all suffering she who suffered that life of suffering without a murmur she the ever chaste and ever pure wife she the ideal of the people the ideal of the gods the great sita our national god she must always remain sita has gone into the very vitals of our race she is there in the blood of every hindu man and woman we are all children of sita any attempt to modernize our women if it tries to take our women away from that ideal of sita is immediately a failure as we see every day the women of india must grow and develop in the footprints of sita and that is the only way swami vivekananda on krishna he who is worshiped in various forms the favorite ideal of men as well as of women the ideal of children as well as of grown up men i mean he whom the writer of the bhagavata was not content to call an incarnation but says the other incarnations were but parts of the lord he krishna was the lord himself 
Krishna, a manicided character, we marvel at the manicidedness of his character. He was the most wonderful sannyasin and the most wonderful householder in one. He had the most wonderful amount of rajas, power, and was at the same time living in the midst of the most wonderful renunciation. Krishna, the embodiment of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, the preacher of the Gita, was all his life the embodiment of that song celestial, he was the great illustration of non-attachment. He gives up his throne and never cares for it. He, the leader of India, at whose word kings come down from their thrones, never wants to be a king. He is the simple Krishna, ever the same Krishna who played with the gopis. The love of the gopis, the resolution of the personal and the impersonal God. This love of the gopis has been found the only solution of the conflict between the personal and the impersonal God. We know how the personal God is the highest point of human life, we know that it is philosophical to believe in an impersonal God immanent in the universe, of whom everything is but a manifestation. At the same time our souls hanker after something concrete, something which we want to grasp, at whose feet we can pour out our soul, and so on. The personal God is therefore the highest conception of human nature the ideal of the gopis, a great landmark in the history of religion. A great landmark in the history of religion is here, the ideal of love for love's sake, work for work's sake, duty for duty's sake, and it for the first time fell from the lips of the greatest of incarnations, Krishna, and for the first time in the history of humanity, upon the soil of India. The religions of fear and of temptations were gone forever, and in spite of the fear of hell and temptation of enjoyment in heaven, came the grandest of ideals, love for love's sake, duty for duty's sake, work for work's sake. There is no better commentary on the Vedas than the Gita. You find in the Gita there is no attempt at torturing any one of them, you Upanishadic ideas. They are all right, says the Lord, for slowly and gradually the human soul rises up and up, step after step, from the gross to the fine, from the fine to the finer, until it reaches the absolute, the goal. Religions and sects are not the work of hypocrites, and wicked people who invented all these to get a little money, as some of our modern men want to think. They are the outcome of the necessity of the human soul. They are all here to satisfy the hankering and thirst of different classes of human minds, and you need not preach against them. The day when that necessity will cease, they will vanish along with the cessation of that necessity and so long as that necessity remains, they must be there in spite of your preaching, in spite of your criticism. You may bring the sword or the gun into play, you may deluge the world with human blood, but so long as there is a necessity for idols, they must remain. These forms and all the various steps in religion will remain, and we understand from the Lord Shri Krishna why they should. Thus, Lord Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, not only affirms the pathways to God, but we also understand from Shri Krishna why these pathways should remain. Swami Vivekananda on Gautama Buddha In the Gita we already hear the distant sound of the conflicts of sects, and the Lord comes in the middle to harmonize them all, He, the great preacher of harmony, the greatest teacher of harmony, Lord Shri Krishna. We worship Him as God incarnate, the greatest, the boldest preacher of morality that the world ever saw, the greatest Karmayogi, as disciple of Himself. As it were, the same Krishna came to show how to make His theories practical. You all know about His great work, His grand character. But the work had one great defect, and for that we are suffering even today. No blame attaches to the Lord. He is pure and glorious, but unfortunately such high ideals could not be well assimilated by the different uncivilized and uncultured races of mankind who flocked within the fold of the Aryans. 
The earlier Buddhists in their rage against the killing of animals had denounced the sacrifices of the Vedas and these sacrifices used to be held in every house. There was a fire burning and that was all the paraphernalia of worship. These sacrifices were obliterated and in their place came gorgeous temples, gorgeous ceremonies and gorgeous priests and all that you see in India in modern times I smile when I read books written by some modern people who ought to have known better that the Buddha was the destroyer of Brahmanical idolatry. Little do they know that Buddhism created Brahmanism and idolatry in India. Swami Vivekananda on Adi Shankara, he who declared, I will come whenever virtue subsides, came again, and this time the manifestation was in the south, and up rose that young Brahman of whom it has been declared that at the age of sixteen he had completed all his writings, the marvellous boy Shankaracharya arose. The writings of this boy of sixteen are the wonders of the modern world, and so was the boy. You may mark one characteristic since the time of Ramanuj, the opening of the door of spirituality to everyone. That has been the watchword of all prophets succeeding Ramanuj, as it had been the watchword of all the prophets before Shankara. I do not know why Shankara should be represented as rather exclusive, I do not find anything in his writings which is exclusive. As in the case of the declarations of the Lord Buddha, this exclusiveness that has been attributed to Shankara's teachings is most possibly not due to his teachings, but to the incapacity of his disciples. Swami Vivekananda on Ramanuj After Shankara came the brilliant Ramanuj. According to Swami Vivekananda, Ramanuj had a greater heart than that of Shankara. He took up the ceremonies and the accretions to them over the centuries and made them as pure as possible. He instituted new ceremonies and methods of worship for those who absolutely needed them. At the same time, he opened the doors to the highest spiritual worship from the Brahman to the Pariya. Swami Vivekananda on Chaitanya one of the greatest teachers of bhakti the world has ever known, Mad Chaitanya. His bhakti rolled over the whole land of Bengal, bringing solace to everyone. His love knew no bounds. Swami Vivekananda remarks that in religious questions Shankara was liberal, but upheld exclusiveness regarding caste. On the other hand, Vaishnavites are liberal regarding caste, but exclusive regarding religion. Swami Vivekananda on Ramakrishna The time was ripe for one to be born who in one body would have the brilliant intellect of Shankara and the wonderfully expansive, infinite heart of Chaitanya, one who would see in every sect the same spirit working, the same God, one who would see God in every being, one whose heart would weep for the poor, for the weak, for the outcast, for the downtrodden, for everyone in this world, inside India or outside India, and at the same time whose grand brilliant intellect would conceive of. Such noble thoughts as would harmonize all conflicting sects, not only in India but outside of India, and bring a marvellous harmony, the universal religion of head and heart into existence. Such a man was born, and I had the good fortune to sit at his feet for years. The divine power working behind him is evident from the fact that the son of a poor priest born in an out-of-the-way village is worshipped literally in thousands of homes in Europe and America. Only let me say now that if I have told you one word of truth, it was his and his alone, and if I have told you many things which were not true, which were not correct, which were not beneficial to the human race, they were all mine, and on me is the responsibility.